Top Med Talk. Welcome to Top Med Talk. I'm Desiree Chapel, host and managing editor of Top Med Talk, and I'm joined by Saul Aronson, our friend of Top Med Talk, and uh, Monty Mythen, editor in chief. Hello, Monty. Hey, Desiree. We wanted to sit down while we we're here to um, talk about some recent publications that came out in the BJA, the British Journal British of Anesthesia. Journal of Anesthesia. Yeah. yeah, well, um, well, first, I think we should mention our relationship with the yes. Perioperative Quality Initiative, Thank or POQI, P O Q I dot org. Uh, formed relatively recently to pull people together to discuss complicated topics and pull together consensus statements. Mm -hmm. And six have been completed so far, and I think about 15 of the publications are out. So this is one of the sort of mid... I'm pointing at a sign here, which is not great radio. Right, it's not great (laughs) podcasting. (laughs) So so at a stand behind us, we have the front cover of the BJA, which has this diagram appeared on the front cover of the May edition of the BJA, because... Within that, there were four publications about perioperative blood pressure. Now, myself and Sol were both at a meeting in London where we got together a group of experts with a challenge to try and summarize what we believe the current situation is with regards to the physiology of blood pressure, paper number one, Mm -hmm. Ackland et al. And then the three other papers were preoperative blood pressure, intraoperative blood pressure, and postoperative blood pressure. And if I may, I've got a takeaway from each of them to get yes. the conversation going. Yeah, I think it's great. It, like this diagram here shows, what the physiology paper reminded me was about the autoregulation. He's pointing to the diagram for those. <laughs> well, of we will. Well, no, we're going to put this. We're going to put this up. Um, we're actually probably going to cut this for those out of you right listening. <laughs> okay, for those of you we're listening, cut that. The, for those of you listening and listening to the snooker, I just want you to know that the red ball is behind the green. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that being said, we are going to put all of uh, these, put the infographics up. And link them. The front cover, the infographic there, relates to the idea of autoregulation in the body, i.e. over a range of pressures, flow is maintained. Now, kind of, yeah, we all know that. But the thing I was reminded of is that the autoregulation point is different in different parts of the body. And as you age and depending on your pre-existing conditions, that autoregulation points can be quite different places. So the splanchnic bed might be quite different to the kidney and the brain. So that's one point I took away from that. From the preoperative one, I took away the fact that there were no major surprises, unless I was sleeping during it. The idea that there's a particular number of blood pressure, hypertension in particular, that should result in cancelling a case, we still don't have that number. But a pragmatic recommendation is if the systolic is very high, you probably should refer them to get sorted out because it's greater likelihood someone's going to cancel it on the day anyway Mm -hmm. and it's a gray sort of known unknown area in the intraoperative one for non-cardiac surgery it's the let's call it the map of 65 the paper actually says 60 to 70 but if we are looking for a current working threshold for most cases it's 65 and for the post-operative bit the takeaway for me was how little we know about post-operative blood pressure measurement how infrequently it's measured if you're sent back to the floor and the signal of harm postoperatively is multiple times higher than the signal of harm intraoperatively that we're currently stressing about. Right. Those are my takeaways. <laughs> Over to you, Saul. Yeah. So we have Saul Aronson. I didn't introduce you yet, Saul. Saul Aronson, our friend with Top Med Talk. And um, Saul, have you? What do you think about some of the things that came out of these papers? I think that was a wonderful summary. Um, <laughs> what What is underappreciated by that uh, pithy? summary is um, it, it really was the result of um, hours, hours, um, thousands of hours of collective research um, by a number of individuals to really gather the world's literature, reasonable gathering of the world's literature on blood pressure, to tee up a two-day intensive session of stakeholders sitting around a long table and um, beating up the data and sort of, you know, defending their positions. And, and what Monty just described is what came out of that intensive session. So the process itself was rigorous it's, and yeah, it's thorough. Exhausting. Yeah. yeah, and, and exhausting. That's for all the pokies, right? That, yeah. that is the process, yeah. Yeah. right? Well, uh, we, in this pokey, we were on the transition from, because everyone likes you to grade. Yes, you know, to grade the evidence. And, right. and the pokey which came out of the ADKI philosophy, the acute used to be dialysis, now disease quality initiative, was quite anti-grade. Oh, that doesn't, that sounds, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It wasn't very keen on getting sucked into the grading process. 
So in other words, they, their original philosophy is there is you have to look at the evidence in a systematic way. Then, and, and if you have experts, it's very rare that you discover evidence that you didn't know when you walked into the room. But let's do that process systematically. But then let's accept the fact that people have got to go to work and do something about it next week. So a bit of opinion is okay, providing it's majority opinion or ideally uh, everyone's opinion. And when you have disagreements of opinion, you document them. Now, from this pokey, which is sort of mid-pokey, to the most recent pokies, they've been sucked into grade, which I'm not completely happy with, but it's hard to get past the reviewers unless you play the grade game. I think we were on that side. Yeah, no, I, I think we have to be practical and yeah. pragmatic in, in the, the, the current, if you will, philosophy and, and receptiveness to those sorts of processes are such that uh, the, those are the hurdles that we have to get over. So, so we... We didn't acquiesce. We just conformed to the reality. Mm. Um, it's a methodologic philosophy rather than dogma. And I think, um, you know, data is data, facts are facts. And um, what we don't know, we don't know. And that doesn't change regardless of the methodology. Well, and that doesn't really affect what the, I mean, what you're saying, really. I mean, how does it? Uh, but, I mean, my uh, prejudice, my bias in all of this is having done very, very, been involved in very protracted, detailed, graded evaluations, particularly for our national body called NICE. Uh -huh. You know, one and a half, two years of having teams of experts torture the data and then grade it. We were none the wiser after two years than we were when we walked in the room. Mm. So I know it's a bit, some people don't like the sort of suggestion of the fact that if you, if you accumulate experts, you have to do a systematic review of some form. You have to do a PubMed search. You have to have your search terms. But you can really spend a lot of time, energy, effort, and money. And I'm not as convinced about mm. that endeavor than I am of collectively producing the outputs. Now, it mustn't be biased by the fact. It mustn't be overwhelmed by opinion. Yeah. But I think you can waste a lot of money on grading. Mm. Interesting. It's just a, it's a, but I just yeah. thought. It, it, it really is. It's a philosophy. It's a philosophy, yeah. And, and um, you know, there's nothing dogmatic about it. It really is just a matter of um, how you choose to interpret um, the science. And the science isn't perfect. Uh, we all know that as scientists, mm -hmm. as clinical scientists, we all know that. But, but you have to translate it. You have to apply it. And, and for it to be effective and meaningful, you have to use it. And, and so the pokey process and, and others yeah. that use different methodologies are uh, really all about trying to collate and coalesce the the science yeah. in, in a practical way to make it usable. And, and so, and so the back to full circle, what Monty uh, very nicely and efficiently, you know, provided us with sort of the highlights of those four papers that are in the BJA now, um, underscore, if you will, the, the uh, propensity of data mm -hmm. uh, and the science with its methodologic processes uh, to apply. And I think, and, and I think um, that, However subtle that may be, it's meaningful. It really is really meaningful to, you know, firstly, paper number one, take us back to the, yeah. you know, the, the um, essence of what blood pressure means, what it, what it is a derivative of, what its implications are. I think we, we, we start with the core, and I think that was a really solid foundational way of beginning the process. Um, and everybody wants to know, practically speaking, um, what about the blood pressure? What is meaningful blood pressure? What is, you know, intolerable and what is tolerable blood pressure? And I think what we, we've nicely done, Monty, is we've gathered the evidence in those domains and, and uh, offered our suggestions for how we can practice as clinicians. And, and I, think, I think that, that in to itself, um, I, would, I would add that we, we've parsed out that the, the data seems to have splintered into cardiac versus non-cardiac mm -hmm. in terms mm -hmm. of what are meaningful um, thresholds, both uh, high and low, and or if there are meaningful thresholds, high and or low, um, preoperatively, uh, intraoperatively, and postoperatively. And, and when you parse it in that way, it, it makes it easier to understand the, uh, yes. the sea of data that... Uh, Can I pursue that for a second, Desiree? Because sure. we... Um, we spent quite a lot of time exploring the cardiac versus non-cardiac. So our original reference point was to say we, we need a sort of reference point for this paper. So it's adult 
major, yeah. you know, non-cardiac Cardiac. surgery, which is where the majority of lif- literature that we were considering at the time related to. But there's been a lot of work done, much of it by Sol and his colleagues, in cardiac surgery. Why? Why are we getting a different message from cardiac, or or is it a methodological issue? I, I don't think it's methodologic. I okay. think it is a population um, difference. Um, I, I you know I wish I could come up with a teleologic explanation mm-hmm. for why that population seems. To, and, and, and let's be clear: the difference is in. Uh, the strength of a signal for a high blood pressure yes. to be meaningful. There, there is essentially no difference in the strength of a signal for a low blood pressure to be meaningful. That is, that is universally true regardless of uh, whether or not you are a cardiac or non-cardiac. So the or, cardiac surgical patient, a threshold of a MAP of 65 is a reasonable reference point. Absolutely. Okay. And, okay. and that, that stays uh, universally true. Um, where we found a difference... Um, principally was a hypertension defined uh, as systolic hypertensive either by pulse pressure hypertension or isolated systolic blood pressure hypertension um, to be a meaningful metric for uh, uh, predicting adverse events. Um, such, such a strength of a signal that, that if uh, you are going to have cardiac surgery, if you are a patient who is de- you know, deemed cardiac by the virtue of a a cardiac surgical declaration, um, a pulse pressure above um, 60, certainly 80, portends significant independent adverse outcomes with respect to cerebral, uh, renal, and, and cardiac dysfunction outcome. Um, these are all database, um, you know, uh, post-operative evaluation, so they're, they're associations. Um, Chuck Hogue, years ago, yeah. looked at this for mm-hmm. a cerebral dysfunction outcome. Uh, Manny Fonts and I looked at uh, separate databases for cardiac, and, of course, we've, we've demonstrated this for renal. So that, that has persisted to be strength. And there's a, a, a very nice European study of cardiac surgical composites that showed the same um, consistency of strength of that signal for high blood pressure predicting badness. And you're saying it's both systolic hypertension on its own and the size of the pulse pressure, the pulse pressure being the gap between diastolic and systolic. That is exactly right. Okay. And that's do you think that's got something to do with bypass? I don't, um, but, I, but it hasn't been teased out. So okay. um, preoperative blood pressure portends adverse outcome. Yep. Um, independent of that observation um, is intraoperative um, hypertension defined by systolic non bypass portends uh, uh, outcome. And, and we also looked at <laughs> years ago with the Chiarte Hospital in Berlin, post-operative hypertension also portends yes. bad outcome. So, Desiree, if I may just a plug, because we'll go into each one. Of, I know we've got a wrap now. We'll go into each yep. one of these papers in greater detail. But www.poqi.org will get it into the show notes. Yep. And the May edition of the BJA. Yep. And the most recent edition of Anesthesia and Analgesia has some more pokey papers about o- the opioid-dependent patient and this, broadly speaking, the opioid crisis. So please do, everyone, look them up. The yeah. infographics are all open source. The publications are all open source. Yeah, and all that actually is listed on the, the pokey site yeah. that you can get all that and then have the links to the papers and, and all that good stuff. So. Um, fantastic. Well, we will definitely come back uh, to that. Thank you all for listening. And... Uh, Cheers. Top Med Talk. Raymond Jerison here. Thanks for listening to Top Med Talk. Now, before we let you go, it's important that we remind you to subscribe to Top Med Talk. That way you'll never, ever miss another episode. Also, if we could encourage you to join us on social media, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, pretty much every single social media platform, we're there. Join us. And finally, check out Top Med Talk. If you go to our website, you can subscribe to email updates. That way we can always tell you where we're going to be, what we're going to be doing, and how you can join us. Topmedtalk.com and click on the section marked email updates. 
Finally, TopMed Talk is proud to act as the broadcasting arm of EBPOM, evidence-based perioperative medicine. We'd love you to find out more about them as well. EBPOM.org is their website. That's E-B-P-O-M.org. And if you go to EBPOM.org forward slash meetings, you can find out about some of the wonderful meetings that we attend and cover across the year here on TopMed Talk. That's EBPOM.org forward slash meetings.